Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our briefing towards the energy system of tomorrow. I'm Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. EESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers. More recently, we've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. Our work revolves around providing informative, objective, nonpartisan coverage of climate change topics in written materials and on social media. Everything we do, briefings, fact sheets, issue briefs, articles, newsletters, and now even podcasts, is always available for free online. And as you might know, we've been working overtime for the past several months to help inform climate change policy discussions that are increasing in intensity and urgency. So that is another way of saying that we have a lot of recent timely content for you to check out online. And the best way to do that is to visit us online at www.esi.org and sign up for Climate Change Solutions, our bi-weekly newsletter, and follow us on Twitter at EESI Online. Today is the start of our latest briefing series, Modernizing the U.S. Energy System, Opportunities, Challenges, and the Path Forward. Our Congressional Climate Camp, which ran from January through May, was designed to establish a baseline climate change resource for Congress and other policymakers. And now starting today, we're ready to focus even more on pathways to meet our new commitments under the Paris Agreement to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50% by 2030. Because so much of the present discussion in DC features in one way or another the word infrastructure, there will, that will be where we spend the next few weeks. Not so much trying to define what it is or is not included in infrastructure. Instead, we'll consider some of the most impactful opportunities for big time, fast acting emissions reductions. The first, energy system modernization, is a subject of this three part briefing series. And the second, which we'll cover on Tuesday, involves the at scale deployment of capital made possible by a national climate bank. We have three experts joining us today to help us understand how we currently power our economy. But our main goal of the session is to help policymakers imagine how our energy system needs to evolve over the next decade or so and what it needs to look like to facilitate a transition to an equitable, decarbonized, clean energy economy. Unless we change the way we generate, move, and consume energy and transition to the resources needed to provide it with affordability and environmental, environmental sustainability in mind, we will find ourselves 10 years from now in even bigger trouble that will be even harder to mitigate and adapt to, let alone try to reverse. So today, our experts will help us imagine what the energy system of 2030 needs to look like to deliver greenhouse gas emissions reductions in line with our new international commitments. Next Friday, we will think about modernizing America's transmission network. And on Friday, June 18th, please join us for leveraging grid ed integration for resilience and decarbonization. If you would like to RSVP for the whole series, visit us online at www.esi.org. One last thing before we start up the presentations and begin the discussion, please feel free to send us your thoughts by email at ESI, uh, by email at EESI at EESI.org. It always gets me the two ads. Or follow us online, uh, follow us on Twitter at EESI online. We will do our best to incorporate your input into the conversation as we go. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the first of our three panelists today. Jennifer Chen is president of Regrid. She works to help clients shape electricity, transmission, and governance policies with an eye toward modernizing grid infrastructure and scaling up clean energy. Jenny has written and presented on these topics, including testifying before the US Congress and the US Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. She is a senior fellow at R Street and senior policy counsel at Coefficient. Welcome, Jenny. Thanks for joining our panel today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and for inviting me to participate in today's briefing. Uh, today's topics are important for Congress, agencies, state and local authorities, and stakeholders as they grapple with guiding the transformation of our power system. The questions I hope to touch on today include, what are the overall policy needs to facilitate an efficient energy transition to cheaper and lower emissions electricity? How do transmission markets and grid edge reforms fit together in a coherent framework? And what are the roles of different government actors? Next slide, please. Our electricity system is evolving. Policies and customer preferences are scaling up wind and solar 
and distributed energy resources, such as electric vehicles. These changes have the potential to be complementary with appropriate policies in place. Wind and solar are lower cost, fuel and emissions free resources, but they are also variable and dependent on weather. Electrification of transportation and buildings and other sectors can potentially help us manage how and when energy is consumed to make the most of wind and solar when it's available and even store it. Another challenge as seen in this map is that the cheapest wind and solar resources are far from most electricity customers and need physical infrastructure as well as a means to trade um, these resources. Long distance transmission is needed to physically connect wind and solar rich regions to customers. Despite investment costs, well planned transmission is expected to produce significant cost savings as well as jobs. And sharing resources over a broader region helps even out variability in wind and solar and flattens out peak electricity use across different time zones. Resource sharing through organized markets can also help improve reliability, reliability, at least cost, and can facilitate achieving state and federal policy goals. Thus, regional market expansion and transmission expansion work well together to optimize the system. Despite the regional nature of these solutions, there is significant roles for states and local governments, and there are models for how that works well. The governing statute, the Federal Power Act, contains mechanisms and allows for cooperative governance. Uh, next slide, please. Regional markets allow distance, distant buyers and sellers of electricity to transact. This helps integrate wind and solar by optimizing generation efficiency over larger regions and enabling cost-effective resources to reach customers. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, oversees independent regional grid organizations. Um, they are known as RTOs and ISOs, regional transmission organizations and independent system operators that operate these markets. In the map, these are shown as the New York independent system operator, the New England independent system operator, PJM or Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland, uh, the Mid-Continent independent system operator, Southwest Power Pool and the California Independent System Operator. However, electricity trade is highly fragmented, as you can see in the map, particularly in the Southeast and in the West, aside from California, where there are no regional transmission organizations. Further, utilities can voluntarily leave or join RTOs unless their membership is required by state law or as a condition to guard against potential utility abuse of its market power. The incentives utilities face, however, do not necessarily spur them to join RTOs. For utilities with business models that make more money by building more power plants, sharing resources to reduce build may not be in their shareholders' financial interests. Potential solutions here could include, Congress could direct FERC to require utilities to share resources as part of an independently operated market to help guard against utilities against overbuilding and overcharging customers. Congress could fund DOE, the Department of Energy, to develop and improve on open source energy trading platforms to optimize trades across borders and reduce costs for new regional transmission organization formation. Next slide, please. An efficiently built network of transmission lines can help optimize the use of electricity resources. FERC establishes the rules for the transmission planning process. However, the main challenges for building transmission are mostly along the lines of interregional transmission planning and siting. Planning is piecemeal and there's no planning process in place for a nationwide backbone grid. As you can see in the map, the US is divided into planning regions. Setting aside the question of how well transmission is planned in each of these regions individually, there is little or no planning in between the regions. Even if we had interregional planning between pairs of regions, 
that geographic scope is still too small to optimize a national network of transmission. A bottom-up approach, compare for example the natural gas pipeline system to the highway system, will be more costly and disorganized, but that's the approach that we're taking today. Transmission upgrades and local projects have risen to cost around about $20 billion a year in recent years, but are focused on smaller projects that are easier to plan and build because they are not subject to, to FERC planning process requirements. Lastly, equity is a concern when determining who pays and where projects are cited. Potential solutions here include FERC is expected to take up transmission planning reforms and could try to fix regulatory gaps for local and interregional planning processes, but it would be a bigger step to require interconnection wide transmission planning. Congress could fund DOE to improve an open source mapping tool uh, that can help transparently identify siting risks earlier and identify corridors that optimize efficiency, equity, and avoid environmentally sensitive areas and cultural heritage sites. Next slide, please. Customers can offer key solutions as well. Uh, customer devices will scale up with electrification and the distribution system must be able to manage higher amounts of smaller distributed resources, discharging and storing electricity. Electric vehicles, buildings, pool pumps, water heaters, et cetera, on the distribution system can also help balance electricity supply and demand. This can help integrate wind and solar and maintain reliability at least cost. Note that for the California heat storm last year, it was approximately 4,000 megawatts of voluntary load reductions that came out of the woodwork after California's governor issued an emergency call and saved the state from additional outages. With a better system of demand response in place, outages could be avoided or reduced. FERC is trying to facilitate this integration of these smaller resources onto the larger grid by allowing demand response, storage, and distributed energy resources to participate in wholesale electricity markets. But as these resources sit on the distribution system, states and utilities have a role to play in tapping into the flexibility these resources offer. The transmission and distribution system coordination is important here as are accurate prices that reflect the value of electricity as well as better forecasting. Congress could fund DOE and its labs to provide technical support to states, RTOs, distribution system operators, or utilities. Next slide, please. I've covered some of these recommendations, but just to summarize here, how can Congress help? Market and transmission expansion and grid edge issues highlight the importance of federal, state, and local authorities collaborating and there need to be forums to work out solutions. Congress could ask FERC and DOE to convene states, local authorities, and stakeholders to develop a coherent, equitable, and implementable large-scale backbone transmission plan. Congress could fund and provide technical, or rather Congress can fund DOE uh, to provide technical assistance to states to study the benefits of market and transmission expansion and improve distribution systems to accommodate distribution, uh, sorry, um, distributed energy resources um, and their proliferation. Congress could fund DOE to improve open source mapping tools to identify transmission corridors that optimize efficiency, equity, and avoid environmentally sensitive and cultural heritage sites while maximizing existing rights of ways. Congress could help reduce the cost of efficiently sharing resources by funding DOE to develop, to develop common, um, a common open source energy market trading platform to optimize trades across borders. Congress could also help align incentives with public policy goals. It could direct FERC to require utilities to trade electricity and share resources as a part of an independently operated market to minimize the potential to overcharge customers. Congress could also en enable DOE to investigate setting standards to encourage greater efficiency for the transmission system. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions.
Oh, well, thank you, Jenny. Um, I actually have two follow up questions. Um, if you want to try your video again, I'm game for that. Um, but I do have two questions. First is, could transmission planning be any more complicated? No, I'm just teasing. Uh, the set, but my real question is, your, your maps are fabulous, and I really appreciate that you included those in your presentation. One of the things that helped convey to me is that we have a big country, and I was curious, um, what impact do the long distances involve? Um, moving from the East Coast to the West Coast, the Canadian border, the Mexican border. Um, do long distances contribute to the complexity of our energy system challenges? All right. That's a good question. So having a diverse set of resources in the country is helpful. And having different time zones that you can average over is also very helpful. So for example, when the peak um, usage of electricity um, is occurring in California, for example, um, that might not be the same um, in other regions. And, and so um, you'll have peaks that come on at different times. And if the system works well together, then um, customers' usage of the system is somewhat smoothed out. And you can also imagine that if you have wind and solar resources, where wind is stronger at night, it's also stronger in the winter, and solar resources are stronger in the summer and during the daytime, these resources complement each other very well. Having looking on a broader geographic scope, um, the wind might be shine. The wind might be uh, uh, blowing in certain regions, and the, the sun could be shining in other regions. And um, and having the system um, bring all of these resources together also averages out that that generation. Um, but in terms of um, uh, the long distances for transmission lines. Um, electricity is something that travels very quickly. So um, it's not, you know, it's, uh, there, there could be issues that, um, that come, that arise because of, um, you know, certain issues like at certain points along the transmission lines, but it's oftentimes these networks are designed to be redundant to, to help avoid um, issues that could um, crop up because of um, a failure at one point. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate your answer. Um, and again, thank you for the maps. I love maps and presentations. Um, great presentation, not just to help set us up for the rest of our discussion today, but also um, really couldn't have asked for a better presentation to set us up for the rest of the series. Um, all of the stuff that Jenny just talked about and we'll talk about with our next two speakers, all of this is connected and interconnected, um, literally, uh, and a uh, great presentation to kick us off. Um, one quick reminder, um, if you missed any of Jenny's presentation, whether the um, slides themselves or her comments, uh, everything is available online, uh, www.esi.org. Everything will be posted pretty quickly, um, and within the next few days or so, uh, maybe a week or so, we'll also have written summaries um, of the presentations that you're hearing today, so there'll be an ongoing resource. Um, that brings us to our second speaker. I'd like to introduce Juan Torres. Juan oversees continuing efforts at the National Renewable Energy Lab and the Energy Systems Integration Facility to strengthen the security and resilience of the na uh, nation's electrical grid. He leads NREL's global initiative to optimize links between electricity, fuel, thermal, water, and communications networks in order to develop and demonstrate new technologies to modernize the grid. Juan, welcome to the panel today. I will turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Dan. And I'm going to switch over to my presentation here. Okay, you see it okay? Looks great. Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, a pleasure providing some information uh, to this great discussion. Um, what I'd like to do is, is talk a little bit about some of the trends specifically that are influencing uh, the evolution of the power grid. So this is historical uh, data that uh, is focused on the different generation sources that we're currently using on the power grid. The information, the data goes here through 2019, but the trends are pretty consistent with where, with the trajectories that we're currently on. As you can see, uh, coal has, uh, we've been de decommissioning quite a few um, 
uh, coal plants uh, over time. Natural gas continues to increase. Um, they tend to be used really well because they, they are great uh, for peaking. Um, they can ramp up very quickly. Uh, and natural gas has been fairly inexpensive over time. Nuclear is fairly fairly constant. Uh, we're really not adding uh, more nuclear, but um, you know we are decomm decommissioning some of the older plants. But it's uh, it's it provides some really good base load generation. The green, uh, which is the next level up on this chart, is uh, renewables, which is more or less it's lumped together. Uh, and we'll talk about that here in, in a second. As to why don't we go ahead and double click on that and uh, expand. The renewable space because that's the one that tend, right now is getting a lot of attention especially with the focus on decarbonization um, so if you start at the bottom that's hydro uh, hydroelectric uh, generation um, you know we can we're, we're somewhat limited on on hydro because we're not adding any more rivers to uh, you know to, to our topography um, and lakes and so on because um, a lot of the hydro uh, hydro plants and so on uh, have been tapped about as much as we can, although we are we are squeezing it a little bit more over time. Um, I'll focus on where the big growth is. It's really in the the green section here, which is wind, and and the yellow, which is solar. Those are the two um, particular generation sources where that that have gone down significantly in cost and um, are, are being utilized uh, in many areas, not, not just where the sun is shining most, which is, tends to be in the Southwest and the wind blows most uh, um, heavily in kind of the Midwest, uh, but uh, across many of the states, they've included them as part of their uh, renewable integration plans. We just completed uh, a series of studies called uh, Electrification Futures. Um, studies. Uh, I included here the uh, the URL for those of you that are interested in finding more data, and I believe there were six uh, six different reports. Um, I'm I'm highlighting here one of one of the really interesting things um, as we're looking out to the future on the energy consumption side, on the electricity consumption side. If you look at the bottom, that's industrial use. So forecasting out to 2050, uh, we looked at a variety of scenarios. But uh, the overall, we see, you know, we're, we're becoming much more efficient in use of electricity for industrial applications. So that's not going to be significantly higher than where we are even today. On the residential side, we also continue to become much more efficient, uh, more, much more efficient buildings, uh, lighting, appliances, and so on. Um, and, and so that uh, will get a, a steady growth but uh, that's not gonna be uh, one of the major uh, contributors to some of the ramp, big ramp that we see. And you'll see as we move up the, the screen here. Um, in in uh, the green, this is uh, the, the commercial uh, business types of offices and so on. So they're gonna get the same kinds of efficiency gains that we're seeing in a lot of the residential applications as well. But in the different scenarios that we see is, is electrification to transportation. We, we are, are seeing that that will have a significant impact in the use of electricity. Consequently, that will also drive the, uh, the evolution of the power grid. You know, where we connect and where we charge vehicles, uh, when we charge vehicles, the size of the charging and so on. So we're talking about everything, you know, from um, uh, commercial fleets, to uh, and heavy duty types of vehicles to light duty vehicles that you know the typical average consumer might uh, might drive and and the technology needed um, on the power grid um, is is going to actually affect the overall architecture and the the overall uh, you know use at different times of, of day so those are the kinds of things that we have to take into account um, what what is driving the change. Okay, so electrification of transportation is definitely at the top of the list. And here I'm showing you a little bit of eye candy as I, I describe this. This is actually a, a model that, that we put together uh, as part of a study on um, the Eastern Interconnect was the primary focus, the, the Eastern Renewable Grid Integration Study, which is uh, the darker gray side, uh, darker gray right half of, of this map. Uh, the lighter gray on the left side is the, the Western grid or the Western interconnect. For this particular study, we did not include uh, Texas. We didn't have their data at the time, um, but I'm using this more to, to make a point. 
um, as we forecast into the future, the different types of generation sources, we need to understand how this is going to, uh, this potentially could affect um, the dynamics of the flow of energy at different types of day, uh, times of day. You can see this is actually, uh, you, you, you'll see a, a shade coming across. It just went from right to left. Because um, in the evening, the blue really, you get to see a lot more blue, that's wind. And right now you see the yellows coming up because um, the, the sun is, is, is shining. This is uh, the sun rising. And um, we're needing to understand how does it, this impact the flows? What transmission needs? Um, does, does this uh, require, um, even at the local level, because this is primarily, we're, we're, we're trying to capture the larger generation plants, but we'd probably see a significant uh, increase in, in local, say, solar generation. Um, the kaleidoscopes on the right and left, uh, the, the one on the right corresponds to the, to the different areas that actually you saw earlier from, uh, from Jenny, some, some of this uh, noted there. And we're able to get a sense of, well, how would the energy flows change between those different areas um, at different times of day and so on. This is looking actually at five minute increments um, with some uh, forecasted data. And on the left side, that kaleidoscope corresponds to, to uh, the Western grid. And then you'll see some bar graphs up above that, that also provide just a different perspective, that same kind of information. You know, the, the reason I, I'm, I'm showing you this is this, this is a dynamic system. Um, it also does not include, of course, just the US. Uh, our, our grid, we are part of the North American uh, grid that includes Canada and actually we dip down into Mexico as well. So the, the strategy that we take forward has to take into account those partners, has to take into account um, the existing infrastructure and how we can build on that. Um, because we are taking a system that's been around over a hundred years and uh, I described this uh, many times as we're taking a 57 Chevy and trying to add some, say, some Tesla types of features. Um, you know, if, if you took your current um, Chevy and say you wanted to add Bluetooth and you wanted it to run on a battery and you wanted to have sensors for collision and so on. Um, that's kind of, in, in a sense, what, what we're doing because we want to get, we want to take advantage of the benefits of, of the existing infrastructure as well. So let's talk about that infrastructure. Um, just to get us all on the same page, historically, you know, we were very much um, a centralized generation architecture. We had large, big power plants that I depict here on the left. And then that was, uh, that moved electrons essentially from, um, from those points to the consumer through long transmission lines. And, and then eventually uh, through a substation to, uh, to, to the consumers, which could be residential or, or commercial what, or what have you. And, and these power plants uh, historically, um, they just basically, uh, they heated uh, some sort of a fuel, whether it's coal or, or um, whether it's a uh, natural gas or whatever it is, converted, uh, converted that into heat. And then you, you uh, boil water, make steam, and that drives a turbine and uh, turns a big generator um, that uh, has a giant magnet on it. So it's an electromechanical system. And, and it's important to note that um, because that's what uh, that, cre that creates in physics we call inertia. You move a big mass and it keeps going and, and you wanna keep it at a certain frequency. And by adding and removing load by people turning on more or less, um, you know, con consumable resources that use electricity, that actually then causes the, you know, that magnet to move faster or slower. And, and so we want to maintain that constant frequency. It's really important. Things have changed considerably. Now we have different types of generation sources that, uh, that are controlled more by mother nature. So we have to have some buffers. So wind blows at certain times better than other times and, so, and the sun shines during the day, not at night. Um, so we're including things like energy storage, uh, are, are things that, that we're exploring. They're not just batteries, there's compressed air, there's other ways to do this, pumped hydro. And on the right side, that's where you see the most change happening. And that is um, the, uh, near the consumer, what we call the edge of the grid. So now electricity can be actually generated by the consumer. It can move from them out onto the grid by used by other consumers, be even used on the, what we call the high voltage bulk grid. And all these different appliances and charging of vehicles and, um, and, and so on are, are making the consumer more active part of how the grid is being operated. 
This is a lot of information, so I'm going to hit this, uh, just the highlights here. On the left, you'll see that, you know, by moving toward what we call power electronics-based generation, and even the end-use devices, it's changing this concept of what I called inertia. Um, so instead of having a big magnet spinning at a big at a centralized power plant, when you have smaller devices like solar panels with inverter boxes that connect those to the grid, and even similarly um, uh, over on wind turbines and so on, um, just fundamentally how those devices connect to the grid is different. We, have, we are still working on how to operate a grid with a lot of these power electronics based devices. And the graph on the right shows we've done this on really small 100 kilowatt systems, say like in uh, Tau Island, American Samoa, and even um, at 100%. Um, at Maui, we've actually had 30% penetration of inverter based power electronics based devices. If we want to get to where some of these goals pro project at 2050, um, with some of this information we have with the terawatt of wind and, and solar potentially on, on the power grid, we don't quite know how to do that. Um, and that's why the research is really needed to help us understand uh, how we transition to highly decarbonized grid also means a, um, a grid that uses different types of technology and devices and, uh, and the amount of inertia on the grid is much, much different. Something else to consider is the advancements in technology, um, artificial intelligence, um, and concepts like autonomous energy systems put much more control within the system itself because it just cannot, it's, it's overwhelming to have uh, humans in the loop to operate the grid the way we did initially. And even today, it, it's, it's uh, very uh, challenging with the amount of information that comes back to operators. So putting some intelligence um, close to the devices, within the devices, so that they understand you know, the, the, how to maintain reliability for the larger system um, and have some level of awareness as to what the goals are of the system. Uh, those are the kinds of things that are, that are being uh, developed and are in research now and, and uh, will be uh, deployed over the next several years. This is an example of one city that's been really progressive and uh, we, we just put out a big report on, on the work done with the city of LA um, where they've been trying to achieve or develop a plan to achieve um, basically 100% uh, use of clean energy for, for all of the needs there. And I will show you just briefly, you know, the importance of having the tools to understand how we get there. Um, this particular tool simulation um, goes in to help us understand, you know, how do all the different devices, as I mentioned, the end consumer um, and, and all these different devices being added to the grid are going to be really important to help us understand how the grid operates. So we need tools that help us understand, like in this case, vehicle loads and vehicle charging, how's that happening throughout the day? Um, we're able to model this and get a sense so we can plan and, and predict better um, to maintain uh, resilience and meet the, the, the load demands um, as, as the, the system evolves. Um, being able to understand um, the electrical uh, loads themselves, again, they vary considerably. Um, through, throughout the day and the new devices, all the power electronics devices and so on. It's important to understand what's going to be out there. I'm going to wrap up with this slide. Um, as we move forward, we definitely need, need to understand how the threats to the grid are also changing. Um, historically, you know, at a local level, the biggest threats, uh, if you ask uh, utilities, are, um, are squirrels and trees. At a local level, those cause the most small outages. But on large scale, natural disasters, storms, hurricanes, tornadoes, wildfires, those kinds of things are becoming much more prevalent, uh, increase in frequency and increase also in impact. Uh, space weather is, uh, is a challenge. Solar flares um, are a challenge. Electromagnetic types of disturbances. Um, those can have impact on large transmission lines. They actually induce currents that could potentially cause some outages. Physical threats have not gone away, especially with terrorism and things of that nature that are around. Um, directed energy weapons like electromagnetic pulses need to be taken into account, make sure that the, that the system of the future is resilient to all these. And of course, cyber. Every day I look in, you know, I'm, I'm watching the news and things that I work on here at the laboratory. This is of utmost priority. 
everything I talked about there has some sort of digital element to it. And if that is the case, it is a potential target or a potential point of disruption. So it's really important that we pay attention to, to the cyber element and incorporate more cybersecurity within the system. So with that, I will uh, pause there, Dan, uh, see if you have any questions for me. Otherwise, look forward to the Q&A. That's great. Um, really, really cool presentation. Um, I think when we post your presentation, it will be static um, as opposed to the animation. Is the animation that you provided or the animation that you showed our audience, is that available? Um, is that available online? Is there a way that people can... Um, I will, I'll let you know uh, what's available. Many of these uh, kinds of animations you can see at, at the lab website. We are a DOE national laboratory. So much of the work that we do, we want to make available to, uh, to, to the public. So I encourage you to go to nrel.gov. Great, thanks. And that's actually my follow-up question. I was wondering if um, the, the cool work that you're doing at NREL, um, how would you describe your coordination with the folks at DOE here in DC? Um, at EERE and, you know, Building Technologies Office and Solar Energy Technologies Office. What, what level yeah. of coordination and collaboration do you have with those folks? Uh, it's significant level of collaboration. So I did not include in my brief bio to you the, some of the other things that I work on. So uh, another hat that I wear is I'm a co-chair for something called the Grid Modernization Lab Consortium. So there is a... Um, um, there is initiative within DOE that includes multiple offices, not just within EERE, but uh, there are five offices involved with GMI. Um, there is Office of Electricity, OE, Office, so EERE, um, Fossil Energy, uh, Nuclear Energy, and CSER because of that security and resilience uh, component. So uh, one of my roles is to help work across those offices and uh, with coordination and, and, and investment in various research projects. Within EERE alone though, that uh, they have a significant amount of work in this space. And so we work with all of the offices across those three major areas of vehicle, um, you know, renewable power and energy efficiency. Um, as, as, you, as I uh, mentioned in, in my presentation, it's important as we, evolve our energy infrastructure that we look at not just the generation side and even not just the grid and how we move the electrons, but the end use and the consumer side is significantly changing the overall energy infrastructure. So coordination across all these offices and investments and research and so on is extremely important. But the really the most important part is that collaboration between government and industry. Because ultimately, that, that is where the ownership and the investment and the operation of that energy infrastructure really happens. Great. Thanks for that. I really appreciate that. Um, great presentation. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Um, just as a quick reminder, um, we, after we, I'll soon introduce our third panelist. And um, when she is finished, we will have a discussion. And so there, are, there is an opportunity for people uh, watching online. Um, and I know there are many of you. Um, to submit questions, you can do it two ways. One, by sending us an email, and the email address is eesi at eesi.org. The other way is to follow us on Twitter at eesi online. And as always, we're live tweeting our event today. Um, and so you can send us a question. Thank you very much. And we'll do our best to incorporate um, the, the questions that come in. We'll do our best to incorporate them into the discussion. Um, our third speaker, uh, is up next, and um, this is Daisy Robinson. Uh, Daisy is an associate uh, in the oil demand team at Bloomberg NEF. She's based in London, and she leads Bloomberg NEF's biofuels coverage. She covers advanced biofuels markets, the policy shaping them, and their role in decarbonizing the transportation sector. Before joining Bloomberg, Daisy worked as an oil trader with Bank of America Merrill Lynch. Daisy, thank you for joining us from so far away today. Uh, I will turn it over to you. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, Dan, and thank you for having me. Um, so, yeah, my name is Daisy Robinson, and um, so far today we've heard quite a bit about power, but I'm going to be talking about uh, the fuel side of things, specifically biofuels and their role in, uh, in the transportation sector. So first, I just want to quickly introduce Bloomberg NEF for those who don't know us. We are the primary research arm of Bloomberg. Uh, we're a strategic research provider covering commodity markets and the disruptive technologies driving the energy transition within those sectors. So our coverage assesses decarbonisation pathways for power, transport, industry, 
buildings and agricultural sectors um, and the pathways to adapt um, to the energy transition. Uh, as Dan said, I myself sit within the oil demand team, uh, where I cover the role of biofuels in decarbonising the transport sector. So looking at the composition of uh, energy consumption in the US, transportation is, is not the largest sector in terms of energy consumption, but it is the largest emitter as of relatively recently. Power, on the other hand, consumes about 40% of uh, US energy, but emissions have been rapidly falling over the past decade, as we just heard from Juan. So transport emissions are disproportionately high considering its energy consumption, and this needs to be addressed. At Bloomberg NEF, we expect that alternative drivetrains, particularly electric vehicles, will play a substantial role in helping to lower transport emissions. We expect by 2040, they'll account for about 60% of passenger car sales in the US and about 40% of the fleet. This is based on economics as we expect battery prices to continue to fall, meaning electric vehicles reach price parity with internal combustion engines in the mid 2020s. After that point, adoption really takes off, but it still takes time uh, for things like this to infiltrate the fleet. And so by 2040, 60% of cars will still be internal combustion engines, which means road fuel demand, while it is, we do see it declining significantly, it's still substantial. So we need other solutions working in parallel to clean up the liquid fuels portion of that demand, particularly for the diesel pool, as it's harder to electrify heavier commercial vehicles. Biofuels are already playing a role here in displacing fossil fuels on road. Um, so about 10% of the gasoline pool uh, is ethanol and around 5% of the diesel pool is, is bio-based. But there is a limit to how much these conventional biofuels can play a role here um, as they face blend limits with conventional vehicles. Um, so ethanol has been a, around 10% of what's known as the blend wall for about a decade. Um, we actually expect that it will eventually break through this blend wall, um, that 10% mark towards the 12 to 13% range, as more and more automakers are giving the green light for uh, their cars to use the higher blend, which is E15 or 15% ethanol and gasoline. So we expect that will become more commonplace, but we think uptake will be slow due to the lack of availability as currently less than 2% of US gas stations actually sell E15. So more refueling infrastructure would be needed in order to help that take off. But in any case, not even a 15% blend of ethanol would actually be sufficient to keep that ethanol demand from falling along with gasoline. Because of declining gasoline demand, we expect that the ethanol blend rate would actually have to reach about 20% by 2040, just for ethanol demand to remain flat at 2019 levels. So this will put um, quite a bit of pressure on the ethanol industry and the farmers that supply it. So looking at some of the clean fuels out there and how they stack up, some biofuels offer some really considerable emissions benefits and um, can even compare with electric. And it's worth highlighting here that these are average carbon intensity values. So in reality, there's quite a big range depending on the source of that fuel. And the fuels I want to focus on today are fuels known as drop-in, which means that unlike ethanol and biodiesel, they have practically identical properties to, to fossil fuels. So they're not restricted by blend walls, uh, which means they could, in theory, replace fossil fuels 100%. And the big value add of drop-in biofuels is that they fit seamlessly into our existing infrastructure, whether that's at the pump, or in engines or in pipeline networks. And even in the case of renewable diesel, there are synergies in the production side of things as well. Um, and also in the case of renewable diesel, it can be used in um, any diesel type fuel application. Um, so it's highly versatile. And it can also be used to produce uh, sustainable aviation fuel, which we've been looking at quite a bit at the moment as this is one of the very few decarbonisation options available to the aviation industry at this point. So levering infrastructure um, that we already have in place is, of course, avoids a um, huge amount of costly overhauls of existing fleets um, and also logistical networks. Um, it also means these solutions can infiltrate the system uh, a lot quicker. But it also has beneficial, it's also beneficial in terms of 
things like preservation of jobs to be able to keep assets running that might have otherwise closed down. But I'll talk a bit about that in a moment. But first looking um, at renewable natural gas, this is mostly produced through um, biological decomposition of waste in landfills, but an increasing share is actually being produced from animal waste from farms and the resultant fuel um, has super low emissions. In fact, it can result in negative carbon intensity as the process uses waste that would otherwise release emissions um, into the atmosphere if it was left to decompose. But the catch is production costs um, are significantly higher than conventional natural gas, which is, is pretty cheap. So the market is largely driven by policy support. And for that reason, uh, a lot of it goes into the transport sector. Um, most of it, in fact, is used in the transport sector because uh, the reason being um, that's where the credits are essentially. So renewable natural gas or RNG generates um, D3 RIN credits under the National Renewable Fuel Standard. And it also generates uh, low carbon fuel standard or LCFS credits in California, um, which are rewarded based on the carbon intensity of individual fuels. So RNG is rewarded particularly highly uh, because it has such a low carbon intensity. So looking at the chart on the right, you can see that RNG already accounts for a third of natural gas uh, vehicle fuel consumption. So there is a bit of a risk here that RNG will kind of run out of room to grow within transport, um, which would damage project returns. In fact, if you look at the California market, which is a major market thanks to the, the low carbon fuel standard, which I just mentioned, is pretty much already saturated um, with RNG. Um, RNG has already displaced about 98% of the state's natural gas demand in transport. So one solution to kind of get around this is, you know, generate more demand. So convert more fossil powered vehicles uh, like running those running on diesel to natural gas. Um, so this is occurring thanks to some initiatives that subsidize the cost for truck operators to convert their fleets uh, to natural gas. Um, another solution is to promote uh, LCFS style incentives elsewhere in the US to kind of uh, redistribute that demand. But also if we look at natural gas consumption, you know, within transport, we see it plays a relatively small role compared to oil. Um, however, there's clearly plenty of opportunity for RNG to displace natural gas elsewhere in the energy mix. Um, but because of those high costs, utilities need regulatory approval uh, to invest in RNG supply for customers. Um, so many states are now taking uh, those sorts of actions to promote RNG use elsewhere in the energy mix, which would give uh, that sector more room to grow. But yeah, in terms of decarbonizing transport, in the absence of a major shift towards natural gas vehicles, there is only a relatively limited role that RNG can play compared to liquid fuels. And that's where renewable diesel comes in. So renewable diesel uh, is made from lipids like vegetable oils, uh, used cooking oil from restaurants uh, and animal fats. And it's practically identical to fossil based diesel. Um, it's a distinct product to biodiesel, which is chemically different uh, to regular diesel. So it needs, so biodiesel needs to be blended in low quantities, whereas renewable diesel can be used 100% in, in any diesel engine. Um, this is a sector that's really heating up at the moment um, and expected to expand really quickly, uh, particularly in the US, as a number of projects are under construction or under development at the moment. And putting all of these projects uh, together, we see that um, those projects would potentially increase the market by about tenfold in just the next five years. And if we look at the type of uh, these projects and break it out by, by the type, around half of these capacity additions um, that are planned in the next few years are refinery conversions, that is converting an old oil refinery to instead produce uh, renewable fuels. Um, and the reason this is um, the case is uh, the process to produce renewable diesel has a lot of overlap. Um, with traditional oil refining in the, the hydro treating um, area. So there's an opportunity here for refiners to reuse or repurpose existing assets um, to really progress the energy transition. Um, and what is more, around half of this project pipeline was actually announced last year in 2020. 
And the reason for that is the pandemic hit refiners extremely hard um, last year as travel restrictions and lockdown really hit uh, demand for fuel. So they found refinery margins were very, very low for a prolonged period. And this led to a huge amount of uh, refinery closures across the world. But in the US, almost a third of that capacity is being converted to bio refineries to produce renewable diesel and other products like renewable jet fuel as well. Um, so refinery conversions of this sort have a lot of benefits. Um, you know, from one perspective, it helps keep an asset running, um, extending its useful life and also preserving jobs. But it also expedites the energy transition because it allows oil and gas majors to really leverage their refineries, their uh, logistical networks, their refueling stations, and also their technical expertise um, to uh, scale up low carbon fuels. Um, and it also helps to lower the cost um, as conversions are considerably cheaper um, and also quicker than greenfield sites. And the reason um, you can see the chart on the left here, the reason that refinery conversions are such a strong trend in the US compared to the other regions, um, it's all down to policy. So RINs uh, and the biodiesel blenders tax credit really buoyed um, production margins through the pandemic while traditional refining margins slumped, um, which created a huge divergence um, and an opportunity. But the big challenge uh, for renewable diesel is whether the sector will be able to scale up enough to displace uh, diesel and jet fuel demand. There's a particularly big focus on waste based feedstocks um, as they have a better low carbon properties, um, but these are in pretty short supply. Uh, producers are making strategic moves at the moment in order to guarantee themselves access. So a couple of examples, um, Nesta, who are the world's largest producer, um, recently acquired Mahoney in the US, which is a company that collects used cooking oil from restaurants. Um, and they also entered into a partnership with McDonald's in the Netherlands um, to turn the cooking oil from their fryers into fuel. Um, and we expect partnerships like this um, to become more typical as producers look to secure this high demand feedstock. But it also kind of works both ways as it helps uh, companies like McDonald's to kind of lower their carbon impact as well. Um, but Neste themselves have said they've identified uh, 35 million tonnes of these waste oils globally available for the conversion of rene uh, to renewable fuel by 2030. Um, so to put that into context, if all of this um, waste were converted into fuel and sold into the US, it would cover less than a fifth of its overall diesel demand. So there's a definite need um, for innovation here to keep the sector uh, growing. And that innovation already exists. So technologies exist that can use household waste or forestry or agricultural residues um, and convert them into a bio crude, which can be further processed uh, into products in existing refineries just like um, the current system of, of refining fossil fuels into useful products. Um, so these waste feedstocks are much more abundant um, than waste oils and can help the market to keep growing. Um, but these technologies are less developed than the technology um, that we already have to convert waste fats and oils. So more investment uh, and incentives to get there is, is needed. Um, policies like the LCFS in California help because they are structured in such a way as to reward fuels based on their carbon intensity. Um, and in doing so, they promote waste feedstocks, but further initial support to get projects like this off the ground um, and up and running would really help boost the sector um, and importantly help decarbonize these hard to abate areas of transport. And with that, I'll hand back over to Dan. Thanks, Daisy. That was a great presentation and um, lots of good reminders that our energy system is not just electricity. Um, we use uh, liquid fuels for lots of things to, in our daily lives and um, that will likely continue for some time. Um, wanted to uh, sort of just use your presentation as an opportunity to plug two briefings that we've done over the last few months. Um, the first uh, is a briefing that we did back in March uh, with actually that featured one of Daisy's colleagues at Bloomberg NEF, um, Melina Bartels. 
Um, that was a briefing that we did on the 2021 Sustainable Energy in America Factbook uh, with our friends at the Business Council for Sustainable Energy. So that briefing is fully archived um, online, www.esi.org. We also did a briefing back in November on sustainable aviation fuels um, that uh, Representative Julia Brownlee helped us introduce. Um, and uh, that briefing is also available. And we went into um, not just SAFs, but also just um, tech advancements um, in aviation, super interesting topics. So thank you so much um, for your great presentation. And um, we are gonna now pivot to the discussion portion. Um, I will invite Jenny and Juan to turn your videos back on. Um, as I have been, as I listened uh, to your presentations, you know, I thought you all did a really, really great job describing sort of how the energy system of the future will be different than the one we have today. We'll have more renewables, we'll have less fossil fuel generation, we'll have more EVs, uh, and we'll have less fossil fuel consumption and transportation. And how that actually shakes out is TBD. Um, but um, you know, thanks to you know Daisy's presentation uh, with a lot of those trend lines, you can kind of see where things are, are pointing. Um, but I want to dig into a couple extra, a couple topics in a little bit greater depth um, in our Q and A uh, to help our audience um, answer some questions that I think they have on their minds. Um, so we'll, Jenny, we'll start with you, and then we'll go to Juan, and then we'll go to Daisy. We'll sort of stay in the order of our presentations. Um, and this first question addresses an issue that has already been discussed to some degree. Uh, and this is the idea of what do we do with the existing en energy infrastructure that we've spent decades and decades building? Um, we can't just discard it and start over from scratch. Um, that would actually have a huge <laughs> emissions impact uh, with all that embedded en energy. Um, how can new energy infrastructure investments sort of use and better leverage what we already have and um, you know, building on what we've already heard, how can we repurpose and what does this look like in practice? How can we repurpose and make use of our current energy system infrastructure to squeeze emissions reductions and as well as efficiency and cost efficiency out of that? Yeah, that's a great question. And thank you for asking. Um, certainly, you know, given existing power plants and infrastructure, we'd certainly wanna make decisions not based on sunk costs, so um, we do want to make sure that we're using existing infrastructure consistent with policy goals. And that oftentimes includes emissions reductions. Um, one thing that I like to highlight is that transmission is a fuel neutral um, source of, uh, it's a fuel neutral infrastructure. Um, and as we de decommission power plants, locating wind and solar to use the associated transmission infra infrastructure could oftentimes um, be helpful if it's possible. Um, existing infrastructure lines and rights of ways can be made to do more uh, with advanced transmission technologies. So we can update existing um, infrastructure with advanced conductors, for example. Some of these um, uh, technologies can extend the capacity of existing rights of ways to carry more electricity. And um, some of these conductors can also reduce power loss, line loss in, in these lines. So when we think about the, the power grid as one large machine, currently we don't have any energy efficiency standards on, on that machine, but we can search for ways to, to make that existing um, infrastructure more energy efficient. Um, another example is that power flow could be better directed um, along transmission lines with newer technologies. I think also we can tap more into the demand side to help cost effectively enhance flexibility and reliability of the existing system. So if we look at devices that customers are buying anyways for non-grid uses, such as hot water heaters, building HVACs and electric vehicles, these resources are essentially batteries that can also help provide balancing services on a range of timescales. So enabling these resources to obtain revenues from the, the markets um, and improving ways that these resources or devices can communicate with the grid can encourage them to provide appropriate grid services. That's great. Um, Juan, do you have additional thoughts about how we can leverage our existing infrastructure for emissions reductions and other gains? Yeah, you know, absolutely. And uh, you know, Jenny had some great comments there that I'll, I'll build upon. 
um, you know, there are some good things about the current infrastructure. It's the reason it's been around so long and we've used to operate it very reliably um, over the many decades, most reliable grid in the, in the, in the world, I believe. And, but, um, you know, there's some things we can add to it. In some cases, you know, there'd been, there'd been studies to look at, you know, should we increase the interconnections between the, the you know, the major grids? Um, that would be one thing, um, DC ties, you know, some more high voltage. Um, I will also say though that, uh, you know, once you start going down into the, um, the, the local level, it's not a one size fits all solution once you go down to, to that level. And what does that mean? It's based on policies and resources. All right. Why, why are why solar and wind, variable generation, and some of these low carbon emitting types of generation sources extremely popular, say in California, say in Hawaii? Um, in California, they have very, very limited water resources, right? Uh, in the Southwest in general. And it turns out the legacy generation uh, plants, the, the large coal and even nuclear and so on, are very, very water intensive. You need lots of water. In fact, um, it's, uh, I believe data I've seen, don't quote me on this, but I believe uh, there's data out there. About 40% of the water used in the US is used for thermoelectric cooling of power plants. The other 40, another 40% 40 for agriculture and then the last 20 for manufacturing and things like that. So my, my point in the end is you really need to look at the local uh, resources, the local economics and so on to assess what makes the most sense that we can build upon from the legacy infrastructure. How can we improve on that? And then how can we add new things that maybe are more plentiful in those regions? Because those resources are not the same all over the country. Um, so so I, uh, you know, I encourage folks to always take a look at um, local economics, local resources. You know, uh, there's other things that come into play eventually too, like even workforce needs you know, uh, locally. We need to develop those kinds of things to make sure we can operate and maintain the system of the future. Thanks. And, and Daisy, I know you already addressed some of these points in your presentation, but I'm, I'm eager if you have additional thoughts. And also, I'd be interested to know a little bit more about um, the end uses in transportation um, in terms of switching in, you know, alternatives to fossil fuels and what's, what's currently out there and, and, and how rapid that transition could actually take place. Yeah, um, I don't have... A um, huge amount to add because, yeah, this was sort of the basis of um, my presentation. And so you really hit the nail on the head that this is a challenge that we can't just discard of all of this infrastructure that um, has taken a long time to build up. Um, and I think that really highlights the key kind of difference between conventional biofuels that have been around for a really long time versus these more advanced drop in biofuels, which can literally drop into the existing system that we've established um, over many decades. Um, so that is kind of the, the crucial difference. And in terms of um, in terms of the kind of end users, um, again, this is why kind of drop in biofuels really solve a problem. And you know, I'm not suggesting that they um, you know can solve the entire problem on their own. I think that alternative technologies that do require um, new infrastructure, things like electric vehicles, things like hydrogen eventually um, will certainly play a role. But for now, we have a challenge where you know fleet turnover takes a long time. Um, you know, whether that's cars or trucks, or if you look at planes, for example, they have quite a long lifespan. So if we kind of, if we wait for that natural turnover to occur um, before we replace and uh, go towards new technologies, something like a hydrogen plane, then we'll be waiting several decades. Um, so, you know, time is of the essence with the energy transition and that's how kind of biofuels can step in and, and really add value there. Thanks very much. Um, the second issue I kind of wanted to use, this as an opportunity to dig into a little bit. Um, is affordability. I think in a lot of discussions, there's an implied um, quality of fossil fuel generation um, compared to renewables in particular. And, and the idea is that, you know, fossil fuels are sort of inherently more reliable, resilient, and affordable. And I think our neighbors in Texas might agree that reliability and resilience are not necessarily inherent characteristics in oil, gas, and coal if you're not doing the, the basics in terms of preparedness. But 
Affordability, I think, is a different question. And, you know, right now we in the United States, we benefit from relatively inexpensive energy. Um, and a lot of that is made possible by um, our natural resources, um, especially over the last few decades, the um, uh, availability of pretty low cost natural gas. Um, we know, however, renewable energy is cost competitive. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily have to impact or have a negative impact on affordability. What can we do, Jenny, again, we'll start with you and then we'll kind of go through, what can we do to ensure that the modernized and updated energy infrastructure that we will hopefully start building and um, expanding upon, uh, what can we do in that um, in those series of investments to make sure that energy um, remains affordable for everyone. So, so yeah, I just wanted to say that we have to overcome the collective action problem to build um, the transmission that we need in order to tap into uh, these cost effective resources and ensure that the energy transition is um, is affordable. And I think the other piece is that um, leveraging the demand side, leveraging technologies that customers are going to purchase anyways, to um, make the most out of these technologies. Um, so smart devices um, uh, in your home, at your business, um, in your businesses, and um, in the transportation sector, like we can really use these to balance the variability in wind and solar. And um, maintaining reliability is something that we definitely want to ensure and continue to study. Um, a lot of these technologies um, that are based off of, um, that are inverter based resources. So again, wind, solar, batteries um, can react more quickly than conventional power plants. Um, so if we appropriately harness them, that could be a benefit for reliability. And I think lastly, just to, you know, just to touch on the reliability question again, um, a robust transmission and distribution system can also help um, ensure reliability because we're looking at larger regions, um, sharing a broader pool of resources, diverse uh, sources of, um, of electricity that, that could help during um, uh, severe uh, weather um, events that, that might just impact um, parts of the US at once. Thanks very much. Um, and sorry about the, the audio feed problem. It, um, I'm sorry about um, having to interrupt like that, but um, hopefully you'll be able to come back in a second. We can see you again, but thanks very much for that answer. Um, Juan, I'd like to hear from you about sort of what we can do to preserve affordability um, in our future energy system. And you know, I think also if you have thoughts about, um, you know, building on what Jenny was talking about with respect to resilience and reliability as well. Yeah, very interested in hearing that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we've become accustomed to paying pretty really low rates for, say, electricity, and even even gasoline has been pretty cheap uh, for over the years. So, um, but you know, things are changing, and how do you do this within the context of things like? Uh, increasing uh, frequency of storms and, and other events, and even the cyber threat. We, you know, we don't want to pay more than 10, 11 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity, um, yet we want it secure and robust against, you know, the um, the, the most equipped adversaries uh, in the world that are targeting our system through cyber means and other means and so on, right? Um, so how do you do that? Uh, that, that? That is a big challenge. Um, definitely, um, th there are some things we can do and have done. Um, an example is say the, you know, the sunshot goal um, that was set by uh, um, administration here, a couple of administrations ago to drop the price of, of solar um, technology. And, and that was done through research, uh, advancements in research, investments in research, and then getting some demonstrations and getting to the points we can get to economies of scale. Um, so it has to be, you know, a, a very coordinated kind of effort. I think government can play a big role to to um, really help with that, uh, but that partnership with industry. Maybe the other piece of it is standards, our standards. Um, if, if you, you know, you just get the technology out there, but you have a lot of competing technologies and it's more expensive to maintain um, and interconnect these kinds of things, um, so, so investments in, in, in the, the right kinds of standards, I think, is really important. Um, that, that court, you know, this is going to be require coordinated effort. 
huge coordinated effort um, from you know the, the public and the private sector. And, and so I think that's, uh, that's really important to establish that communication uh, to be able to uh, be clear on where are we going, how, you know, what, what are we trying to achieve here? Um, and <clears throat> if you just let the market drive it, um, then sometimes other things like resilience or, or security could potentially lapse because you need to have uh, many times, like some of the work that I do, that government perspective to understand what is the threat, what's going on there, what do we need to be, a, be aware of? Um, so that resilience aspect is another thing, you know, when I talk about security and resilience, many times it's more like, it's like buying insurance. And so understanding that level of risk that we're really willing to, um, to attain or maintain is also important. You know, what, what level of reliability, what level of resilience is important? There is a difference between resilience and reliability. You know, reliability is you're trying to keep a bad thing from happening, keep that probability low. And resilience is assuming you're going to assume something bad's going to happen, but how do you get that system back up and running, uh, minimize the cost and the time? So, so I think having that 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 uh, common understanding of what are those goals across the board, common you know uh, the coordination across standards, and and then I think uh, a really um, strategic. Um, in investment in, in research and, and demonstration. Thanks. And Daisy, over to you. Um, very interested in hearing your thoughts about um, affordability in the um, transportation sector when it comes to liquid fuels. Yeah, so this is a bit of a challenge, I guess, with, um, with these advanced biofuels, um, particularly, you know, looking at solar and wind, which are kind of getting cheaper. And this is not necessarily the case um, for liquid fuels because you're adding kind of a, an another layer of process to actually, you know, acquire the feedstock and, and convert it into fuel. So there's a chance that, you know, that process will always remain expensive or more expensive than, than the fossil fuels that they replace, particularly if we look at the kind of oil, organic oil-based um, renewable diesel as what I was talking about, because we're relying on a feedstock supply that is relatively finite. Um, so, uh, and and also additionally, the technology that we use to convert it is is fairly well established. So there's kind of fewer opportunities there for for cost reductions over time. Um, but that's why I think it's very important to to keep investing and keep supporting those newer technologies that I mentioned at the end, um, which are capable of converting uh, more abundant resources like household waste. Um, because there, you know, we're not at risk of, of depleting those resources anytime soon. Um, these ex these technologies are, are much more expensive now, um, but they have more potential to come down over time um, because you know they're very they're less developed at the moment. Um, but you know, as they scale up uh, and develop, um, yeah, they have much more potential for cost reductions going forward. But I think you know, there's there are some benefits as well um, when we look at homegrown fuels. Um, in, if we look back at history, at you know, oil prices that uh, can be very much at the mercy of, of external factors or geopolitics. Um, so you know, it kind of feeds back to that energy independence or um, that sort of thing to to have um, a bit more control over prices uh, than maybe historically with with oil prices. And that probably applies more broadly than just renewable diesel, say, just to biofuels in general, right? Things are able to grow here. Um, would it help if I ate more French fries um, to help keep the oil? I feel like we could start something there. I feel like a more French fries campaign. We could work with the potato people, perhaps. And... <laughs> yeah, I'd be on board with that as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. That's a, that's a different department at Bloomberg. Um, great. Thank you for... Uh, Jenny, for coming back, um, because I'd like to kick off the last question um, with you. We'll set the French fry issue aside for a moment. Um, one thing that we think a lot about at ESI is sort of how um, the impacts of climate policy, what the sites, sorts of impacts of climate policy and investments have on um, communities that have over time been marginalized or been not included in decision making. Um, oftentimes, these are um, communities of color, low-income communities, frontline communities. And I think it's fair to say that fossil fuels have not had a great track record when it comes to uh, impacting nearby communities, oil refineries, coal mines, two examples of things that are not 
terribly pleasant neighbors to have. And, you know, so often the communities impacted um, had little or no say about uh, where these facilities and where these operations have been located. As we sort of take our steps, as we make our investments to um, improve and modernize our energy system, uh, do you have thoughts about what we should be doing differently to ensure that new infrastructure does not have the same negative impacts on affected communities or perhaps even could help um, uh, improve and, and sort of mitigate some of the past negative impacts that, that fossil fuels have had on, on people? Yeah, absolutely. And it's important to give traditionally disadvantaged communities a voice um, as a starter. So some process changes could help here. And as an example of that, FERC is standing up its Office of Public Participation, which should hopefully help with the infrastructure siting that FERC influences, um, such as natural gas pipelines. And I think that there are some creative solutions that could be create a win-win situation. So if we look at transmission siting, for example, siting is typically an equity issue. Um, there are overall benefits to building a more trans, uh, robust transmission network, but some might object to siting these lines in, in, over their lands if they don't see any direct benefit. If we come up with a transmission planning process that is more transparent, inclusive, and looks forward to potential siting concerns by engaging stakeholders early, we have a better chance of developing creative solutions. One example is that um, a transmission siting solution um, where a Native American tribe was given equity in a transmission line and thus is able to obtain revenue from siting a, um, a line on their lands. We can also think about just transition and think about regions that might be looking for jobs and um, bring, bring those stakeholders to the table to see if they would be willing to site infrastructure um, with appropriate protections, of course, to make sure that their communities are protected. Um, Juan, I'm eager to hear from you, um, sort of how can we ensure that um, future energy system uh, infrastructure investments don't create the same kinds of negative impacts that some of our past investments have had on um, marginalized and low income and communities of color? Yeah, you know, we have a lot of work going on in this space in the, the area of environmental justice and energy justice and so on. And, and um, the experience that we've that we've had is it really comes down to understanding this, you know, the stakeholders, the impact on the stakeholders there, taking into account, um, you know, those, uh, you know, historically marginalized uh, folks, it, it's because they weren't taken into account. That wasn't important. It was maybe it was more important. Uh, to get something done, you know, at the lowest cost within a certain time, um, and not thinking about the long-term ramifications. So this is—it's really taking more of a, a more strategic perspective and asking those questions uh, early on on these projects and engaging the stakeholders, so you have a better, well-rounded understanding of, of what the the not just the short-term implications are, but the long-term. And um, I think you know Jenny's point about you know. Can you find equity so that there is a win-win? There's some win for all the stakeholders. It's not going to be equally distributed, likely, um, but but that everybody sees, you know, what what is the benefit um, for uh, you know for their stake and and their support of, of the project. Daisy, we'll turn over to you next. Yeah, um, I would definitely echo uh, both of the sentiments of the other two panelists, but I would also just finally add um, kind of one final concept, I guess, when it comes to liquid fuels, um, and that is converting uh, waste to liquid fuels is kind of making a useful product out of something you know, that we have no other use for. So it's kind of a win-win in that regard. And so when we're thinking about, you know, other benefits to communities other than, you know, cleaning up the transport fuel mix, I'd say that uh, that's another really obvious uh, benefit is actually, you know, utilizing waste products, which would have otherwise ended up in landfill or, or that sort of thing. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we have time, I think, for one more uh, question, and you know, Jenny sort of inspired this this question, um, and I think we'll we'll probably have to wrap it there. Um, 
but I'm very interested in sort of your thoughts. You know, one of the things in sort of in, in Washington, D.C., is we're having these policy discussions. One of the things that people always want to know about is what are the job implications? What are the job creation implications, workforce development implications? And Jenny just mentioned the concept of a just transition, which I think is something that's very important, something that we've covered in other sessions. Um, and, uh, and I think it's um, uh, perhaps worth a little bit of discussion here. Jenny, we'll start once again with you and we'll go around the horn, but um, could you help from a, for, for a policymaker audience understand um, of all of, of the things you've talked about today, what some of the workforce development opportunities are, um, are also possible as we're reducing emissions, as we're improving equity, as we're making all of these improvements? Um, what do you see in terms of workforce development opportunities at the same time? I think we definitely need to look on a, a community by community basis because we know that a clean energy transition does create clean energy jobs, high paying, um, good quality jobs. Um, but um, a lot of these communities that are losing jobs um, might not see a one to one replacement in jobs. So I think that there is an, an important um, there is an important uh, effort to look at what kinds of jobs that, um, that, that could benefit some of these communities today, um, not, you know, not too far in the future. Um, what kind of workforce training opportunities, what kind of immediate job opportunities, and we might have to look uh, further than just in the energy sector, but um, expanding horizons, um, looking on a community by community basis, and listening to these communities, I think, um, could help carry us further um, in, in the just, um, in just transition. Juan, I'm curious what you think, and also um, if you have any thoughts specifically around sort of the role that research and development could play um, in um, creating new opportunities for new types of jobs related to the clean energy transition. Uh, yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, uh, we really are going to need a workforce that understands um, some of the new technologies, you know, uh, understands the, the computer um, interface here, the, the under, you know, a lot, a lot of folks that understand the cyber aspect. Um, I will add a couple of things to consider here. As we're developing these new systems, we need to understand what is the new life cycle for these systems. Okay, um, <clears throat> so how you know there's everything from, you know, when you install these things to operate, and then some sort of an end of life. These systems are going to be a little different than what we've had before, and there's going to be jobs created, you know, throughout that um, that uh, that life cycle. Another aspect of this is the supply chain. So, you know, what, where are we going to get the components, um, everything from hardware components, electronics to, you know, materials, and we need to, you know, con consider the rare earth kinds of materials, and make sure we're not reliant on, on these certain materials that are maybe controlled by, you know, some other country, um, as, as well as, um, you know, the software aspect of it. So all those pieces, I think, are really are super important and opportunities for us to you know, be strategic in creating the, the jobs and then identifying the workforce that's gonna be needed there. Um, so I think that's it's a significant opportunity that, that needs a little bit more thought. Thanks for that. Daisy, I think this means you get the last word on the panel. Nice. <laughs> um, yeah, so I would just add um, to finish off that, you know, on the liquid fuel side, um, as of, yeah, I've been discussing, there's still going to be demand for liquid fuels for the foreseeable future. Um, and therefore, you know, the, the drop in biofuel element, you know, another benefit is that there are a lot of synergies with um, the existing setup. And therefore, that technical expertise that um, employees have uh, working within refineries or, or that sort of thing, who've built up this kind of um, technical knowledge over a long time, that knowledge and skill set will still be valuable um, and it won't become redundant. It can just be applied to this kind of new cleaner um, technology. So um, yeah, I think that would be um, where I'd round it off. And that's kind of a, another benefit of, uh, of drop in fuels. 
Well, thank you very much for that. And um, that brings us to the end. Uh, Jenny, Juan, and Daisy, thank you so much for three excellent presentations and a really great discussion. Um, I really enjoyed talking with all of you today, and I'm sure our audience did too. Um, uh, as a reminder, if you missed anything from any of the presentations, um, everything will be posted online, including the webcast, www.esi.org. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. It was a real pleasure to get to meet you over the last couple of weeks and uh, talk with you today. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to uh, wrap up. Um, I have a couple things to close with. Um, I think we're going to put some slides up in a second. There we go. Um, so the first is today's session, while excellent and awesome, uh, is just the start. We have two more sessions on modernizing the U.S. energy system. And if you like today, and if you want to learn more about a lot of the topics, we have opportunities for you to do so as early as next Friday. Um, we will be looking at modernizing America's transmission network, transmission network next Friday, also at noon Eastern. Um, we will then be on June 18th, we'll be looking at leveraging grid ed integration for resilience and decarbonization. So a lot of the themes and a lot of the topics we talked about today will be carried through the rest of the series. Um, we will also have a briefing on Tuesday, I think also at noon, but all the details are available online, um, about uh, the potential emissions reductions from a national, uh, national climate bank. Um, and we have a really excellent lineup for speakers for this one um, from all over the country talking with us about that. So um, we will be focusing our efforts on in June, like I said earlier, on sort of where we can get the most emissions reductions from the various points in the infrastructure debate. Um, so I hope you will take the opportunity to join us once again on Tuesday and then the following two Fridays to wrap up the series. Um, I would like to thank everyone, uh, in addition to our panelists, I'd like to thank everyone at ESI who worked so hard behind the scenes to make this all possible. Dan O'Brien, Sidney O'Shaughnessy, Amber Tataroff, Anna McGinn, Omri Laporte. I also like to thank our four interns, uh, Anna, Ashlyn, Irina, and Jackson for all of their help, um, you know, live tweeting, notes, all of that great stuff. Thank you so much for helping us out today. Um, we have a slide up right now. This is a link to a survey. If you have two minutes and you would be willing to share your feedback about today's session, we'd really, really appreciate it. If you had any issues um, with links or with our live stream page, or if you have ideas for topics or uh, formats, we uh, read every submission um, that, um, that our audience provides using the survey. We really find it valuable. We're always trying to do better to improve. So if you have a moment and you can fill out the survey, we'd really appreciate it. Um, I will conclude there. I hope everyone has an excellent weekend, and um, I look forward to seeing many of you back next Friday, and hopefully many of you back for Tuesday to talk about the National Climate Bank. With that, thanks again. Thanks to Jenny, Juan, and Daisy. Thanks to everyone at ESI. Happy weekend, and see you next week. Thanks.